So, welcome to the show, Dr. Niva and Rick Macy. Good to be here. Thank you for having <laughs> us. Oh, mate, it's an absolute pleasure. I've got to say, like, you know, people listening on audio, they're not going to be able to see this, but my background is a mirror and a pair of curtains, whereas the background that you guys have got looks like it's got incredible tennis people on it. <laughs> Go ahead. This is a wall of fame. It doesn't include me in it, but it's the wall of fame. No, no, back there is a lot of stuff uh, from the movie King Richard. Obviously, that was... Uh put a bow around that whole thing and told the true story. And that's a lot of stuff from the uh, after party back behind. Amazing. Well, it looks brilliant. Come on. Well, I mean, we're, you know, we're going to talk a lot about your guys approach to tennis, your guys approach to life and the importance of the mental side of life, the mental side of the game and how they all work together. Um, the book is called Billion Dollar Mind. And it's called that because of the belief that those who triumph over their minds can attain the value of a billion dollars, irrespective of monetary wealth. So this is really a book for those looking to develop mental strength in the game of life, often through the le lens of tennis. It is not out there. For, it's not for those people looking to make a billion dollars in a get rich quick scheme, but it is a great read. Now, I think one of the themes that really stands out for me through the book is the power of positivity. Dr. Niva, why is being positive so important? That That is just an excellent question. So positivity, right? Have you ever, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever seen anyone who's successful in life who's not positive? It's not possible. They're not. You That's cannot question, be right? successful without positivity, without being able to believe or have positive thoughts about yourself and your goals. Uh, so positive thoughts to me are like, your best friend and it's a positivity there's no end to it and you can reach there's, there's infinite amounts of positivity you can have and that positivity generates so much in terms of positive action so i talk in the book about neuroscience and how uh, there's sensory input and then motor output so sensory input if you have a lot of po positive thoughts that will give you uh, that's kind of like uh stopping our own breaks you know, and allowing us to succeed. So all that positivity allows us to do positive action. And that will allow us to, for instance, win or uh, get the goals that we want or make the interview that we want or get the train on time, you know, things like that. There's all that positivity gets us to where we want. If we, I don't think anybody can succeed with negative thoughts. So, so it yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. It's so interesting because... I sat there, uh, my uh, our 11 year old, he's called Ned, and we were at the national championships last week uh, over in the UK, tennis, and we watched matches together and, and he saw some players go into meltdown. And I said to him, I said, did it help any of them? Did their level go up? You know, and he really got it. You know, he's an 11 year old kid, but he's seeing that it, it doesn't help, does it? Um, I mean, Rick, I know you you share Dr. Niver's belief in that power of positivity and, and the power of simply having fun. And I know there's a quote in the book that I really love. There's so many quotes in the book that I love, but there's one that said, I've always tried to be very serious about the work that has to be done and taking ownership, but also in the way that I try to connect with players and motivate and inspire them. I always want it to be fun. I always want to create passion in them. And it's really interesting because I've, you know, in some performance programs, high performance programs, I don't think they always think that fun should be a big part of the algorithm. But, you know, you've coached people like the Williams sisters, Andy Roddick, Maria Sharapova. Has creating a hardworking but fun environment always been the approach you take? And, you know, and if so, why? Yeah, first off, great question. And absolutely, that's kind of been the cornerstone ever since I've done this the last 45 years, you know? And when you're having fun, okay, uh, you're gonna get the most out of people because they enjoy it, you know? But then I gotta back the truck up a little bit, how to say it, when to say it, why to say it, who to say it to, how I would talk to your kids might be different than a 22 year old girl on the tour, but I pick and choose the spots. I know when to go for the jugular, but I know you got to make it fun and you're, you got to motivate people and you got to inspire and educate. So, you know, most people, when they're so rigid, 
it's more about them. And to me, you know, I'm kind of like a woodpecker. I try to find an answer. Okay. And everybody has different buttons you got to push, you know, not a wrong way or a right way. There's a better way. And so, but the positivity and the power of belief, I can put more confidence and courage in the players uh, before they even think about it, let alone have it. You know, winning breeds winning and confidence breeds confidence. But I can get people to believe, you know, and I can get people to then to achieve. And you can only do that when they're enjoying it. You know, you got to pick your spots. You got to know when to kick them in the butt and all that stuff. But there's an art to this, you know, and it's dealing with individuals because that's what you're dealing with. It's not a system. It's everybody's a little different. But the way I go about doing it uh, is going to be different depending on that day with that person. Come on, Doctor Nipper. I know you. You were a pupil of Rick's. Tell me, you know how how much did you enjoy his lessons way back when? Huh? I was just gonna chime in right there because I was. I remember this moment. Like I was. I, I'll never forget. I, I grew up in Georgia, and in Georgia is the hottest sun. I mean, humid. And it's here hot here too. But I remember one of the coaches I had, and we were playing for six hours on a Saturday, like back and forth volleys, overhead drills. I mean, back and forth, and it was draining and intense. And, and then I had never, I finally met Rick, you know, later on in my, in my career, in my junior career. And I went to his academy and the first thing I know, I mean, I forgot about the heat. I forgot about the intensity because he has music. Like, you you don't know, like, you don't, where's the first time you're playing tennis with music? It's almost like you're dancing. It's the best experience ever. I never uh, could, you know, I didn't realize how important that was, but it was so fun. We still have music. So I like, yeah. Like the small things. I mean, I think Rick, you probably don't even realize what the other world is like. But it's so when you when you're playing tennis in the sun, there's no shade. Uh, in the, in Georgia, I'm like dripping in sweat. I had to change my shirt. I was so sweaty and so hot. It was almost miserable and muggy. And that feeling was just kind of draining. And then you have someone like Rick. It's like whoa. It's like it's almost like a party. You know, you're you're playing. You're working hard. You you have to. It's all day long. You don't even realize it's all day because yeah. there's music and there's so much positivity and there's fun. And there's jokes and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and, just but no, if I could if I could chime in a little bit yeah. more on that, because this is such a powerful subject, you know, the environment that a coach that you can create. And that's kind of what I did with Venus and Serena. You know, even when we talk about communication, even though they were uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, I never talked about other kids. I talked about Kingus, Navratilova, uh, Steffi Graf you know, she would have got that, you know, the whole thing in the mental part and to inspire and just the way I go about doing this is it's probably very different than anybody in the world. And that's probably why I still teach more than anybody in the United States. And I teach, you know, 50 hours a week, seven days still, you know, and I love it just as much as I did when I started at 22. So at the end of the day, um, and people want to be around that. They, they want you, especially with younger kids, you know, you got to extract greatness. One word can change a child's life, you know, and especially with me, because obviously I kind of have the, the platform a little bit and some credibility there. You know, when I say it, it's beyond powerful, you know, but you got to mean it. You can't just be all rainbow, lollipop and sunshine all the time. You, know, you got to pick your spots. But that's how I just keep raising the bar and I get people to run faster, jump higher, think bigger, um, Besides all the mechanical, biomechanics and all that stuff, but the mental part, the, to, that's I'm more a life coach, in my opinion, yeah. than a tennis coach. People don't understand that. To get people, uh, you know, and Tommy Ho, who was probably the greatest junior player ever, he only got to 82 on the, on the Pro Tour. He was the most dominant junior player ever. And when I got inducted to the Hall of Fame, he said, you know, Rick wrote me over 200 letters. And he got me to believe that I could do anything. And I'm sitting there going, wow, because he never told me that, you know, but I didn't do it for any other reason. Which coach writes any student their letters? I've never heard of that. That's like beyond the day, by the way. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And, you know, the whole tennis is life. Life is tennis. The things that you yeah. can learn, the things you can inspire, you know, and, and certainly coming back to the point, how music, you know, a simple thing can change it to a party like environment where you're willing to go that extra mile. You don't know it's the sunshine. Um, I mean, the, the, the book, the great, great points guys. And I think the book 
really brings some brilliant techniques to for how you can master that mental side of life. And um, I mean, Dr. Niver, for you know, to bring the power of the book to life for, for the tennis parents and players and coaches who are listening. Can you tell us one technique from within the book that will help demonstrate something they can do in order to improve their life, improve their tennis? Absolutely. There are just so many. I could probably spend an hour on that, uh, more than that. But I think the most important thing is the is the is I liked and which helped me was positive affirmations. That was like my favorite part because that was actually something that helped me when I played tennis. Um, so when I was playing uh, tennis, junior tennis, I remember the simplest things of speaking positive words to myself every single day, every morning is so powerful. We don't realize how much we have negative thought and talk every day. I mean, to this day, I have trained my mind that as soon as that negative voice comes in, boom, I'm just like, no way. And I switch it to positive. So positive affirmation saying, I can do this. I can win this. It's a uh, sensory input to allow ourselves to be able to carry out an action. It allows ourselves to be able to win. And I think a lot of times we don't allow ourselves. We don't really, you know, I don't even, that's what the whole book is about is, is our own thoughts interfering with our success. And so the book, so I think if we can tell our, the kids or junior kids trying to, to win, like your, your, your kids, if you say every morning, you say, uh, and this is what I spend a lot of time doing because I've got into habit of winning in my own little local sphere, like in the Southern Tennis Association. But I would tell myself, I'm gonna have an amazing serve. I have a great forehand. I'm gonna move my feet. I am number one. I am a champion. I would say that all the time to myself. <laughs> it allows you to win. And it kind of brainwashes you to to be that person. Uh, because yeah. sometimes like I heard uh, someone roll their eye the other day and I don't remember who it was. I don't wanna remember who it was. Maybe someone in the family saying, oh, that's so stupid. And, you know, that word stupid is so powerful because all of a sudden I saw my thought. I watched it. All of a sudden that word came into my head and it came again. And I said, I said, I talked to myself, that's not accurate. You're I'm in control of my thoughts and I'm going to uh, change that thought process. So very important to keep that positivity we generated. So our actions are positive. So positive affirmations yeah. are really important. Spending a few minutes every morning saying positive things, and even that even leads to visualization of winning. So all of those, that's very powerful for, I think, tennis. And then there's another, I love the hard work component to it because there's no end to hard work. And uh, there's an example where, you know, I, I love the, they're like how there's so many examples where like like Venus and Serena are doing like they're, they're, they're dri you know, driving over here from California uh, to Rick's Academy and they're, they're doing like shadow strokes in the street. You know, they're not stopping their tennis because they're working that hard. Nobody can understand that concept of hard work. Um, and it is, it's beyond uh, uh, imaginable. There's no end to it. And the only person that limits us is ourselves. You know, we ourselves, yeah. like today I had somebody, uh, to come, I came from Orlando to Boca and I had someone driving me and I asked her, she asked me, can you give me a hint on this book? Can you give me a practical tip? And I said, well, what do you want? She's like, I want to get this job. I said, well, uh, you have to practice your interview skills. And she's like, oh, uh, I got to get a course. I said, no, on YouTube, you have it. You can do it while you're driving. The only person stopping us is ourselves. She's not able to manage that. So a lot of times we ourselves stop ourselves with our own thoughts. And it's incredible how much if we let ourselves win and let ourselves be number one, and let ourselves achieve, we can do a lot. You know, let, let me chime in here a little bit. You know, people, I, I give a speech every day at 10 o'clock uh, after the academy before fitness, and it's as much for the parents as the kids. And it's all about perspective, you know, the way they look at the world, okay, because we let, like Dr. Nip said, we let everything influence us. We control the situation. We cannot let it control us. It's all perspective. You know, we are aware, most people, maybe what we put on our mouth, but we're not aware what we put into our head. You know, what you hear, what you read, what you see on TV, social media, there's so many things that infiltrate, you know, and it, it's tough to kind of monitor that. And I try to tell people every day, you want to have these things written down. You want to look at positive things. 
You want to go on YouTube, look at, listen to motivational speakers. You know, it's a habit. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, positive. You got to change the attitude. Because listen, I've done this for a long time, not just tennis, but people in business or other uh, people in high level NFL, NBA, hockey, you name it. The best of the best of all the rest, they're the most positive creatures that ever walked the face of the earth. That's the cornerstone. Or they wouldn't even be there. That She said that earlier. They wouldn't even be there. But you got to rewire. You know, everybody thinks our brain is controlling us. We're controlling it. It's all backwards. It's all backwards. That's what people don't understand. And it's mindset. And that's why uh, people, when I teach them or they're around, you know, Rick Macy Tennis Center, this place is like Disneyland and Candyland here in Boca, uh, with all the energy that comes out of it and the hundreds of motivational signs, you know, people, they want that because people let so many other things affect them. You know, and yeah. at this stage of my life, I'm almost bulletproof. It's all how I look at things. Nothing really bothers me. And a hundred things a day could, but nothing bothers me. I still care and I get a better result because I, I just stay on track. But that takes mind control. And that's what I try to yeah. help a lot of parents teach the kids and the kids uh, to think differently. And I can have maybe probably more impact on a lot of these kids than their parents because it's a different voice and I'm, I'm not teaching them i'm not just changing a stroke i'm changing a life and that's kind of what i do and when people come back whether it be christian rude who i taught casper's dad or all these people that uh that i've worked with they don't talk about the forehand or the backhand or the serve or the volley it's like the work ethic they say some of my some of my own quotes even capriotti when she made the comeback down there at the Miami tournament was the Lipton. She started quoting things that I told her. Winner finds a way, loser makes an excuse. All these little gold nuggets that I tell the kids when they come back, that's the best feeling in the world because I know that I've made a difference in someone's life. Brilliant. Love it. Could just listen all day, guys. I might just forget about my questions. I'm just loving listening to this. Um, but it's but what I love the most is that, and, it, and it's kind of the essence of the book here is, you know, if there are people out there who struggle with being positive or or players struggle with being positive in difficult situations, the book is great both for the parent and the player and for the coach to understand because it's full of techniques of how you can be positive, of how you can flip things, of how you, you can master the mental side of it. Um, Rick, another area I loved, you know, when I heard you talking about, it was being asked who your favourite pupil is and, they were, you know, is it Serena? Is it Venus? Is it Andy? Is it Maria? But you said your favorite pupil is always the one who is on the other side of the net. We have a lot of coaches listening. Can you explain why this is? Well, my favorite student of all time right now is next to me. It's Dr. Niv. I got to say that because she's next to me. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. No, listen. No, you got to understand. It's it's all it's all the way. It's all the way I've always been. You know, it's not Venus, Serena, Capriotti, Roddy, Mesquina, Pierce, Kennan, Rude, Bethany Maddox, Sands, Alami. I could go on and on. You know, Darwin Blanche, who's going to be like the next star, I think, on the ATP tour. It's like, it's who's ever on the other side of the net. That hour, that minute, that second. And that's the way I've always felt. You know, some people, whether I'm teaching you or I'm teaching the number one 80 year old guy in the United States, okay, which I do, okay. I, and, and the guy hit the ball flat like Jimmy Connors, you know, and in five minutes, I flipped the script and he's like born again. He goes, Well, Rick, I've never hit top spin in 65 years. So um, that's just the way I've always done it. And when you have that mindset, and listen, I could have traveled. I could just work with pros. I work with about 30, you know, and they come in with their coaches. I work with the best kids in the world. I work with, I tell everybody, the hamburger, the cheeseburger, the filet, the quarter pounder. I work with everybody. So, but that's the way I feel. And I think that's a sign of being professional, having pride in yourself, expecting more from yourself, instead of just saying, I only want to work 
with this person or that person. And to take it further, I got to bring this up because you said coaches are going to hear this. You know, one guy came up to me and he was working with a girl like, you know, five in the state of Florida. This is a while back. And she had a temper and she'd throw her racket and, you know, she had a bad attitude, uh, but she took lessons, you know, and they could afford to. And he said, Rick, I don't want to work with her anymore because she has a bad attitude. And I said, okay, here's the game plan. That's why I want you to work with her even more because that's your job to not have her have a bad attitude. And you can start talking about the parents or this or that. You look at it as a challenge. I like the ones that are sometimes a little crazy, have a temper, they're lazy. I get them to be the fastest. You know, that's the challenge of a coach. Not everybody's going to say, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Run for every ball like Venus did. You know, be the perfect student. That's some. That's easy. Okay. The sign of a great coach is that anybody, anytime, anywhere, who's ever on the other side of the net, that hour, that minute, that second, if that's not your best student, okay, you're really cheating the game. And more importantly, you're cheating yourself. Love that. I absolutely love it. And I get it. And what's like in my coaching world where I've gone into schools and things, often the pupils I love working with the most are the ones who are lurking in the shadows who come out via tennis and find themselves via tennis and, and find a passion. And it's not that they're going to go on and be a Wimbledon champion, but they've found something that they enjoy that brings that brings joy to their life. And uh, so, yeah, I, I totally understand what you're saying. I really do. People are, and surprised, what, you know, by that. People, oh. people are surprised by that because, listen, there's been over 300 national champions. You know, we're just talking about the window dressing, those people that became number one or I, I work with them. You got to understand, that's the way I feel. You know, that's just the way I feel. And so when your student can feel that, that's how you extract greatness. I'm just telling you, that's how you, that's how you motivate, educate. It, it just, that's what it's all about. But that's a mindset and a habit and an expectation of yourself. It's fantastic. And I mean, Dr. Niva, you know, in terms of, we've just been talking about the mental side and how some, you know, some players, some some juniors struggle with that mental side, but it's the coach's job to try and help them through that, to learn self-control, to learn positivity. But, you know, in terms of learning how to handle pressure, control their emotions, you know, it, you don't see junior players working on it like they work on the repetitions of the cross-court forehand. Dr. Niver, how much time should, you know, junior performance players be spending on on mastering their minds as i said i i think that i, I agree with, i love this question because mind control is uh equally or if not more important than uh tennis technique because there's no way any professional athlete or any number one in the world can achieve that status without having a strong mind um and having a uh, mind control as well as positive thoughts. And the reason why we were, I was just saying is that it's because when there are challenges outside someone outside one's control, and if the mind is not under control, if there's no mental strength, uh, the person's already lost before they, before they can showcase their talent. There's obviously, there's just no way. And so I think uh, mind control and spending time on mental strength is more important, in my opinion. Uh, and and that you have to have a good game. That's 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 a no brainer. Yeah. Uh, but there's no way you can be number one in the world without that. Yeah. It's so important. Yeah. Yeah. No. no. Okay. This is kind of my wheelhouse. So uh, I'm, I'm going to unpack a lot of stuff here. Okay. First off, if you don't have the ability to remember to forget, okay, you're not going to be good at hardly anything. So let alone sports, let alone tennis, where you're by yourself. That's why you see people are better in doubles because they got a therapist on the court. They miss a shot. They hug, they kiss, they high five, and it's gone. That emotion, that's went out the window. Where in singles, it sticks to you like Velcro sometimes. And you can almost go to a junior tournament and say, he's winning, he's losing, she's winning. You can almost see it. So what I try to do is not only... Uh, educate the parents, but the kids, you know, I try to give them all these things to do, 
you got 20 seconds, like it happened 20 years ago. You go back to the fence. You don't come out until you're ready and you feel amazing about yourself and you get them to be in a routine so they become a machine. And no one was more like that than the great Maria Sharapova. This little girl at 11 was in a bubble when I had her. Had limitations, but that mental box was checked, kind of like Sophia Kennan when I had her at seven, the scariest little creature I ever taught. So that being said, you want to tell the players, what do you want to do? And they say, I want to be a pro or I want to be great, whatever they their dreams are. Copy Nadal, copy Federer, copy the Joker, copy Iga. Look how they are after each point. Don't listen to me or you, even though they should listen to me a little bit more, but look at them. <laughs> look what they do. Yes. They lose a point. Look how they handle it. Okay, no one's perfect. Everybody gets nervous. Okay, but they're never afraid. But look how they handle. Look at their body language. Look how they are. You want to be great? Look at greatness. That's the last time I looked. The best way to get smarter, be around smarter people. Okay, just, you know, the sports psychologist, that's a place. But that's, to my opinion, that's a little bit different. It's more cookie cutter. You want to be great? There's the picture. Imitate that guy. That's what Iga did against about Rafa. Okay, imitate it. It's hard to do because when something bad happens, you have a response go through your body. Okay, it's probably not the best response, but you can you forget about it and move on and become bulletproof? Because if you hit the ball, I tell this to all the kids, if you were hitting against Alcarez and you hit it in the net, you'd feel a certain way. And if you hit the ball into the net, and you were hitting against a seven-year-old, you'd feel different. Why? Still went into the net. Okay, it's perspective. <laughs> it's a perspective. It's how you handle stuff, and it's mind control. And to put a bow around it, and this is why I knew Roddick, there'd be a place for him on the Pro Tour. I didn't know if he'd win the U.S. Open. When I had him at 12, he was number one in the nation. But his thirst for competition was like no other. Anybody, anytime, anywhere. And this is what everybody has to tr understand. Any coach who's listening to this, it's not the biomechanics and footwork and all that. That's important. But if you can get your player to be the best competitor they can be, run for every ball. If you're not afraid to fail, you're going to succeed. If you're not afraid to lose, you're going to win more. Don't you, you don't start off in the quarters. You got to work your way through it. You know, you got to teach and become the best competitor. And from that, you will handle pressure better. And that's why I took a chance on Venus and Serena. I saw there was a rage in these two little girls, okay, like no other. It wasn't because, oh, I thought maybe they're going to be six feet tall, five, eleven. That was the icing. But inside, when you are that competitive, you're going to handle pressure better. And that is the mental strength. If you want the one amazing gold nugget, you got to train yourself to love that, okay? But if you're all about competition and you just love to compete, even if you're getting crunched like a bug, you know, 6030, could you still be loving it? Most people would say no, okay? But if you're all about the competition, yes. And that's what it's all about. So hopefully the coaches out there can grab onto this. And that's the leader in the clubhouse. I, I I wanted to add to that because I was thinking, how many players have you seen that may have amazing technique, amazing footwork and athleticism, but you don't hear about them? How many? I've, I've seen a lot of them playing out there. They're great. And you're like, they've never made any name. And then you see players who are maybe great, but they, they may not be perfect, but they have excellent mental strength. And they're the ones you know, uh, that you hear about. Absolutely. No. And, the people, and the people listening, you know, and the kids have to understand. I ask the kids all the time, how many of you guys have lost the match to people and you have a better forehand, a better backhand and a better serve. And you're going, how did I lose to that guy? Six, two, six, two, because he runs, he fights, he sweats. Exactly. But the next point he's there every time, cool. you know, and it, that's a big thing. And that's a staple, I, the people you see at the highest level on TV. But you can't just look at them, oh, she has a bad serve, or she can't volley, or you, 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 we look at that. But to get to that level, what's inside, 
those players, uh, they're bulletproof. And then you, when you get to people like Djokovic or wherever, that's just rare air, you know. And I'm sure when he's retired, he'll tell all his secrets. That's a whole different but animal. Rick, but and, and Rick and I can speak for, from experience because Rick played uh, matches and won matches even with broken wrists. You know, like he's just like that. I was down a break. I was literally down a break. You're right. That was back in the day. So <laughs> I was down a break. Literally. <laughs> literally. Yeah, I can tell you. Oh, Rick, I didn't really have the best technique. I struggled a lot and tried to learn it on my own, but I was always winning because I had to, the focus. Like one time I played all my semifinals of nationals and like my knee was bleeding and you know, I'd, I'd fallen on the clay and it was bloody. And I still never forget that point where it was match point. And I still with a bloody knee was, I won the point just because of that mental strength and focus. It does not matter sometimes how talented you are and mental strength, I think wins. So your answer is that I think mental wins over everything and, else. And, and then and this, this, what I love about this though, is like, I don't know what, how it is around the world, but I guess that in a lot of programs, there is not a focus on developing mental strength, resilience, the ability to forget and go again. Yet it is so important. And that's why coming back to the book, you know, in terms of parents, coaches, <laughs> helping players, this is this is how, you know, and some people will be fortunate enough that maybe they can work with a sports psychologist or the access to sports psychologist or whatever. But for those of the players who can't, you know, reading billion dollar mind and just i think the parent the player they're going to come out with it with some very practical and inspiring ways of being able to develop the mental strength that that you guys have just been talking about yeah. um i mean it, in terms of rick i know like you must have come across an awful lot of tennis parents of all different sorts of shapes and sizes. I'm, I'm the leader you... of the clubhouse. I should be in the Hall of Fame just for putting up with those parents. Uh, that Forget what I've done. I mean, I, I'm the leader of the clubhouse of parents, but ask the question. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, it makes me laugh. I mean, it, but basically, I mean, you must have seen the most incredible things in terms of tennis parents. But if you could give one top tip to tennis parents of aspiring juniors, what would it be? Always remember their kids first and tennis players second. And it's the hardest thing to do. You know, it can create, you know, problems in the family. I mean, it, people just get out of control. You know what I'm saying? It's a junior development. It's not junior final destination. It's not where you start. It's where you finish. You know what I'm saying? And that's why, you know, I became best friends with Richard Williams. Uh, he was teaching life lessons all the time. He was a great father. Okay. Once again, I should be in the Hall of Fame, put up with that guy, you know. But listen, some of the best coaching is keep your mouth shut. You know what I mean? And just live another day. So that's what people have to understand, you know. So, but no, that would be the biggest thing. And if I could give one motivating advice, they should always try to inspire uh, their kid. They, but some, unfortunately, some didn't play sports. They don't understand. They're learning on the job. You know, it's easy to start coaching a kid. You hit it in the net, aim higher. You hit it long, more topspin. They become the coach. You know, we know the drill. But to inspire their kid and get them to believe, you know, because as they develop, you know, their mind will be able to reason more. Some of these kids, the brain's not even developed. It's some people not at 40, you know, it's not developed, but. The, the brain takes longer to develop and they reason and they mature and they handle things like all of us differently. And I always tell the parent, well, what would you have felt at 12 years old? Do you think he hit that in the net on purpose? And I'll say it, you know, and they just go bang, bang. They're just stuck in their tracks because they're so far over here. They don't, I go, he didn't do it on purpose. I said, it was a positive error. It's going to go in down the road. He missed that because he needs to grow two inches and gain 10 pounds. I, I just present it so differently. Um, but that would be the parents. It's not where you start. It's where you finish. You know, your goal should be try to go to college to get the best college scholarship. Pros icing on the cake, you know, and this thing changes. When people grow, they get bigger, they get stronger, they get more mature. Uh, I can tell you so many people, I could list 100 people right now that were number one in the United States in the 12, and you never heard of them. 
or I can name 20 right now, number one in the world, an ITF at 18, you never heard of them. And I can tell you many people who have never won a national title here in the United States, you know, and they're top 10 in the world or top 20 in the world, you know, and everybody matures later, work hard, have a great attitude, you know, support your kid, inspire them, because tennis is only a little microscopic piece of what the kid's going to do their whole life. I love this. I love this. I think, you know, I spend my life around tennis parents and the vast majority, you know, well, but they're all, everyone's striving to do their best, but it's a difficult job. And I just think if people can listen to this guidance, I will try and spread that this guidance as far as wide as I can within the UK tennis parent circles and beyond, because human first, child first, you know, you like you see some of these kids who are giving everything and, you know, they don't get necessarily positive reactions from parents. And yet at home in their bed, they've got teddy bears because they're so young that they're still, you know, at that stage. It's like, oh, Rick, that's good to hear. How about you, Dr. Niver? What, what, what would your tip be if you had a tip for tennis parents? Is there, What would you think? hundred uh, percent. I have prepared a lot of tips for tennis parents. So I can tell you one thing I learned and from my own personal experience is that sometimes we, sometimes tennis parents think that the kids really love the game when they really don't. And we have to, we do not, we're not open. Tennis is so narrow. We just like tennis, tennis, tennis becomes a, an addiction and parents are so addicted to their kid and it becomes a routine, you know, and you don't listen to the kids and uh, I can tell you from firsthand, I had looks lucky that one of my kids was listening to Tony Robbins and Dean Graziosi, you know, these are success coaches here in the United States. And they said, one of them said at four, like, uh, I don't know, like, you know I'm sorry, I'm going to disappoint you. And and that was a big eye opener right there, because I was doing everything in the world to kind of say, okay, well, maybe it's a coaching, maybe it's a technique, maybe they need to get off their iPad, maybe they need more motivation, they need, and it's the wrong path. And this book really helps because it's like, what is it that our minds like to do when no one's watching, when no one's grading, when there's no money, when there's no award, award towards it? What do we love to do in our free time? And that's really key. Yeah. And finding that about a child, understanding what they love to do, and then you'll find geniuses beyond, beyond your imagination. Kids are very talented, very gifted in their field. It may not be tennis. So just be open-minded yeah. as a parent um, and, and you'll see so much. It's yeah, so true. About, and what, another thing about the book real quick, there's probably, um, <laughs> you know, 50 hours of private lessons in this book about the mental game uh, from Rick Macy, you know, just how to look at things differently. And, you know, it's, it's mindset. And that's the first thing I got to do. If I have a talented kid with great hands and great feet, it's not going to matter unless I can get him to think and act like a champion at a young age and the influence and the ripple. Here's what's crazy. The ripple is uh, they get better grades. They clean their room. They might get off drugs. Whatever the deal is going on, they have different friends. This cascades in so many different directions, uh, the way I try to do it and what's, gonna, what's in the book. Um, and you asked earlier about how much time. It's really individualized, but... The, the coaches need to spend more time and give concrete ways to go about, you know, teaching the mental game because kids don't like to do anything like that or visualization or they don't want to even do those. They'd rather run, sweat, hit a million balls and think they're going to be famous by Friday. It ain't going to happen. OK, it's not going to happen. They got to work on it. And when people listen to every single word that I say and put it in their journal, I know one thing, whether it's tennis or whatever, they're going to be the best they can be. Oh, man. Come on. I love that. And I think, you know, right aside next to you, you've got someone who's lived that journey and who's gone on to be a real prominent neuroscientist who's been to, I think it was Harvard, He's wasn't it? He's got an incredible degree. You know, it's the life journey that tennis can bring, can play a part in the education that is the tennis court. Oh, I mean, Dr. Niver, I've got to ask you, because I think, to be honest, we've had a shed load, a shed load, I guess that's a bit UK colloquial, quite a lot of Macyisms within this interview, which is amazing. But you must have heard so many over the years. You must have heard so many uh, that Rick is famous for. So 
What is your favorite Macyism, Dr. Niva? I love that because I used to, whenever I'd come to the academy, I would see his, the Macyism, so they would ignite this enthusiasm for me to do better at work. And so I don't know, it just, it just focused, I love them. Uh, you know, they're just, I can think of a million, but I like my favorite one is this one, think big, be big. And the reason why I like that is because we are as big as our biggest thought. You thought that is the most important, it's so profound. We are as big as our biggest thought, our greatest thought. So our thoughts, if they're uh, lofty and big and they have big dreams and goals, we're gonna get there and we're gonna work hard towards getting there. We're gonna reach sure. for the moon and who knows where we land, but we're gonna get to that level. Start with the level. dream. Yeah. It starts from the thought. And we have to think big, and be big and if we don't if we if we're thinking small you know as small as people some people are thinking very small you know and uh and for me i love that because then it just encourages me to think okay outside the box what is my dream what is my dream life what is my ideal life what do i want to do to help the world and uh, if we can think bigger and our thoughts get bigger we're going to become bigger so very That's important come on love it love it it's a great example you know Coming back to the music, like there was this song when I was about 16 and I remember to the lyric to this day, it was a real positive song. And the lyric was, believe in yourself, you know what you'll find. There's no fault in a trouble-free mind. And it's like, it stayed with me all the time. It's like, and when I needed the positive uplift, like I would play that song because belief, you know? And uh, I've got to say like the book, um, there's so many Rick Macyisms dotted through the book. It's a part, it's a theme that goes through, but each one, you know, if you start in the day with some positive affirmations and reading these little quotes, I guarantee that, they, you know, they are going to help you. They are going to help you. Now, Rick, there's um there's an infographic out there that from Tennis Canada, and um it says that seventy percent of kids quit sports before they turn thirteen, for the primary reason they aren't having fun. We kind of touched on this earlier, but I think it would be like if you were put in charge of sport around the world, how would you address this statistic? Huh. Well, I think you just hit on the head. You know, I think at the at the end of the day. Um, if you're not having fun and enjoying this thing, okay, that's going to lead to, like you said, burnout. But I think the parents burn out because the kids are losing or not having the success that they have and then create an environment, whether it be at home or around the kid. And that, that leads to this. But to answer your question, okay, it has to be manageable that it's not too difficult and you got to go through the progressions. But I think the, the coaching part of it, the way um, people would teach the kids, you know, and everybody's at a different level, you have to inspire and motivate and keep it so fun and not cutthroat. There's many different levels, you know, but everybody wants to get to the mountaintop you know, they want to take the escalator. And we all know we got to take the stairs. This is a journey. And it's more of that. It's it's fun. And when people, even Bernthal said this in the movie, one of his best coaches of all time, that they made it fun. They were, they were serious. Games and bets and tricks. A perfect example is this. We can go three hours. The kids are dead tired. Okay, they can't do anything more. And I say... Okay, we're going to play tag. Okay, that's where you run and you tag people and you freeze them. And you know, there yeah, might be yeah. six, eight kids. No one's tired anymore. They're laughing and they're running and juking <laughs> and shaking and baking and twisting and shouting. It's crazy, you know? And instead of getting a, a fitness coach out there and they're doing sprints and, you know, burpees and they're doing jumping, all this insanity, I go, like, I get them. It's probably more beneficial because they're using their mind and they're being creative. And, you know, Venus and Serena love to do tag with the other kids. The problem is when Serena tagged someone, she had a closed fist. So I said, whoa, 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 we're not confident. You got to tag them with their hand open. So, but at the end of the day, that's a perfect example, okay, where you have to make things fun, but still productive. Yeah. And that's in the eye of the beholder. And you ask her what her favorite quote was, the Macyism. 
Mine is easy, and it's what you may see is different than Rick may see. <laughs> Come on. But I do think, like, you know, if there was more people playing tag in this world, this world would be a better place. You know, I'm not just talking about the kids, the, the adults. See, get these politicians Rick, playing well, tag. They ask me every day, we playing tag. <laughs> Either they want to get out of doing sprints, but they're doing actually more agility, stopping, starting, little steps, imagination, thinking, and anticipation, and it's fun, and they're doing it with other kids. People, it's so vanilla, but it's the best vanilla in the world. And, and, and so, you know, cool. Go ahead, talk to me. One of the thing is, after your lessons, he doesn't say this, but he's always giving little kids something, like a T-shirt oh. or a hoodie. And they're just laughing. They have so much fun. They're like, gonna go get a hoodie. They love that little bit of a prize or some sort of gift. And I think that also makes it a lot of fun, including the music. So it's just a great environment. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Come on. Oh, it's great. I know it's really interesting, actually. Like the tournament I was at last week with my son, and we went to a swimming pool after play had finished with three of his mates. And all they did in that swimming pool, I was the parent, like, keeping an eye as some of the others were uh, like checking in and stuff. And then um, they, uh, they all just played tag. It was all they did in the swimming pool. They played tag and they absolutely loved it, you know, and, and it shows that competitive side, that fun side, that running through the water. It's probably another workout. I'm not sure that's what they need after a hard day's tennis, but just to your point, Rick, that's what they wanted to do. Absolutely. You know, and that tired part that we just talked about, that's all mental too. Tired's all mental. You feel it, but that doesn't mean you have to be tired. I tell people all the time, uh, will you run 10 laps around the court? And they go, if they say no, I said, would you do it for $1,000? They go, absolutely. I said, well, you got it backwards. If you run the 10 laps, maybe one day you'll win an extra $1,000. So everybody has it backwards. You know what I mean? So the tired part's unacceptable and everybody has more inside of them. And that's the art of coaching, okay, to push, but to push delicately. And real quick, I, I got to tell this story. Now that you got me going, okay, it was 90 degrees in Florida, 2 o'clock, Venus and Serena were practicing. Uh, it was near the end of practice. Serena was in the tank, okay? It was old, 90 degrees, very humid, like a frog would go across the court. He couldn't even make it. That's how hot it was. And I said, Serena. You got to move your feet. And she looked at me, you know, like that look she gives everybody at the U.S. Open back in the day. She goes, why? I said, you say you want to be number one. She goes, I will be number one. Okay. I said, well, what I got to do to get you to move your feet. Okay. She goes, Rick, I'm really hungry. She was always hungry as a kid. Okay. She goes, hey, Scott, that was one of the coaches, go to the snack machine. I want some hot curly fries, a Snickers bar, and a Pepsi. And on the way to work, Daddy drove by a stand and they were selling Green Day t-shirts. If you get me the Green Day t-shirt, the Snickers bar, the Pepsi, and the curly fries, you see that girl over there? Because Venus was on the next course. She goes, I'll make that a tall, skinny girl look slow as molasses. I said, hey, Scott, go get the curly fries, the Snickers bar, the Pepsi. Tomorrow, you got to get the Green Day t-shirt. So we brought all the goodies back. Serena went under the canopy, had her snack. Listen to this. She's hitting cross court and down the line. One of the hitting partners was 450 in the world. The guy never missed the ball. He could beat her 0 and 0 in like 20 minutes. The sweat is pouring off this little girl, okay, like Niagara Falls. No water, okay, one hour straight. I'm on the other court with Venus. It got to be like 315. She goes, hey, Rick. It's 3.15, and you better have that Green Day t-shirt here in the morning, okay? But here's the moral of that story. She was in the tank. We already practiced five hours. The practice was over. Richard was gone, okay? He went, he went there. And I got this girl to hit 4,000 more balls, quality, and it just took that mental strength meter up another notch. One more gold nugget in the little Compton Comet. Come on. Come on, I love it. It's so cool. Really like these stories. Thank you so much. I mean, we are getting towards the end, guys, but I think one I'm really intrigued at because I hear, I know, pickleball, increasingly massive in the United States of America, big in the UK, big around the world, but 
How about you guys? What are your thoughts about pickleball? Want to go? Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, it's not tennis. It's a pseudo uh, tennis. And so people like feel like they're playing. It's beneficial for a lot of my patients who have nerve damage or they're overweight. They can't move. Um, so they come back and say, Dr. Jared, I didn't, you know, I did I didn't play tennis, but I played pickleball. So I I tried that. So they they get the exhilaration of having like, you know, trying to hit a ball over a net. And uh, they have the ability to play with it, you know, it, it, friends and colleagues and and have that social environment and they don't have to move much. So it takes a limits that like footwork. It's hard for me to ever get on a pickleball court. You'll never see me in a pickleball court, I don't think. <laughs> I could, I don't think I could say that, but I could say that it's great for people who have limited mobility. So it's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, listen, I think you're, it's, uh, I think it's great. You know, it's, uh, people can get exercise, they get competition, they get outside, yeah. they move around. It's easier than tennis. You know, you can just kind of, it's like advanced ping pong, except the ball's a little louder. We have uh, six pickleball courts here at the park and we have all kinds of camps now and then, um, I don't teach it, okay, but I, I think it's great because especially when older people, it's just another venue for them to get extra hot exercise. And you know, if you if they love it and they enjoy it, then everybody wins. So I, I'm all for it. Come on. It's, I knew you guys would give a nice positive answer because I know that's who you are. I've read the book. <laughs> um, guys, I mean, th th thank you so much for your time. I've got a final question for both of you. Uh, it's a question we ask guests who come onto the podcast. If you could go for a drink with anyone, alive or dead, who would it be and why? Dr. Niver first. Oh, I, I think you'd know that answer. That would be with Rick. I really enjoy his company and I would I spend time. It's always, I was. I, I love every minute because I'm always learning things from him and very positive. He might have a, a foot pain or a back, who knows what kind of pain, doesn't even say it. Uh, so I'm like, wow, you know, if you have such a benchmark of someone like that and it's, he eats like five items a day, he doesn't go to, you know, he doesn't drink. <laughs> so I don't know if that question is valid. <laughs> but I mean, if I eat, dinner, not to drink. Yeah, but it's still five items for 30 years. It's the same thing. So much motivation in my mind. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, this vendor, this is like incredible. It's like a machine. A human, I mean, just eats the same thing and thinks positively every day and so strong mentally and does his exercise and runs every morning. I have no excuse. I'm going to I'm gonna have to give her a hoodie. Okay, she's <laughs> working. Yay. Hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the kind of stuff. I love that sort of motivation and always being able to you know, uh, there's this, there's no limit. I say sky's limit. Sky is not a limit. It's beyond the sky. So there's yeah. no limit. No, I, first off, I love the, I love the question. You know, I'm such a, I'm just one of the guys. Okay. Even though I've had, you know, success and stuff like that, I'm just, I'm such one of the guys and very approachable. And I don't really look at things. I'd like to meet that guy or do that or stuff like that. It's the person to my left here. Okay. Uh, this is why we do this. We're going to do many more books, you know, together. And uh, that would be it. I would say my cat, I have a cat here that I've actually trained. It, they, the cat listens to me more than some of my students, but I don't know if I could take him to dinner. I just take him for some cat food. But it would be Dr. Niv. Uh, it, I'm not, in, it wouldn't be, uh, uh, that would be it. That would be it. That's from my heart. Love it. I love it. And you know, the thing is, I mean, I'd like to be there with you guys, genuinely. I okay. so enjoyed chatting that, you know, and I, I honestly would. I'd love to be there with you and uh, talk more about tennis, the live, talk about the book, you know, and uh, I'll make sure the links to the book are all over the podcast and the website and everything. And, and it is such a great read. And if anyone has listened today and come out of it thinking, you know what, maybe that mental side of tennis or maybe bringing a positive approach to life is something that i could look into a little bit then i highly highly recommend billion dollar mind you know and i really hope that people will will read and and learn and and enjoy because uh yeah well done guys and you make a great partnership you see that in the book you see that today so i'm so grateful for you guys for finding the time and uh and yeah and i'm very pleased that rick's cat did join us on the camera as well <laughs> 
I told you, he just said uh, we're inseparable. Rob, you are amazing. You know, he actually read the book. Yeah. Gave sent us pictures and you found the positivity in this book. You found what we we're really looking for. Is that yeah. in tends a lot about mental strength. You really don't have a book uh, focus for that. So it's incredible. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me. Just us. just a wonderful person. If you're coming ever to Florida, you let us know. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Do you know, I would love to I would love to come see you guys. You guys know do you know what the Battle of Boca is? Or there's a tournament here no. Saturday? With, uh, and it, yeah, no, no, we have like it. 85 tournaments here a year, a ten thousand dollar tournament every weekend. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like I mean, Shelton played it two and a half years ago, I and mean, we got everybody, and we have a lot of wow. 25,000 here besides the academy. There's something, there's something for everybody. We will look it up. We would love to come and see you in Florida. And uh, yeah, that would be amazing. So, but guys, thank you so, so much. I, I hope you'll have an amazing day. And thank you for your time. And yeah, I, yeah, I can't wait. I will be reading the book again. All right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. We'll do it again.